Cosmology and Modern Science by Titus Bruckhart, Part 4. Even the least phenomenon participates in several continuities or cosmic dimensions, incommensurable in relation to each other. Thus, ice is water by its substance, and in this respect it is not distinguishable from liquid water or water vapor, whereas it belongs by its state to solid bodies. Similarly, when a thing is constituted by diverse elements, it participates in their natures, even while differing from them. Cinnabar, for instance, is a synthesis of sulfur and mercury. It is thus in some sense the sum of these two elements, but at the same time it possesses qualities that are not to be found in either of the above two substances. Quantities can be added to one another, but a quality is never only the sum of other qualities. By mixing the colors blue and yellow, green is obtained. This third color is therefore a synthesis of the other two, but it is not the product of a simple addition, for it represents at the same time a chromatic quality that is new and unique in itself. Herein is to be seen something like a discontinuous continuity, which is even more marked in the biological order, where the qualitative unity of an organism is plainly distinguishable from its material composition. The bird that is born from the egg is made of the same elements as the egg, but it is not the egg. Similarly, the butterfly that issues from a chrysalis is neither that chrysalis nor the caterpillar that produced it. A kinship exists between these various organisms, a genetic continuity, but equally they display a qualitative discontinuity, since between the caterpillar and the butterfly there is something like a rupture of levels. At every point of the cosmic tissue, there is thus a warp and a weft that cross one another, as indicated by the traditional symbolism of weaving, according to which the warp threads, vertically hung on the loom of primitive form, represent the permanent essences of things, and also qualities and essential forms, while the weft, which binds the warp together horizontally and at the same time covers it with its alternating waves, corresponds to the substantial or material continuity of the world. The same law is expressed by the classical hylomorphism, whereby the form of a thing or being, seal of its essential unity, is distinguished from its matter, namely the plastic substance that receives the seal while conferring on it a concrete and limited existence. No modern theory has ever been able to replace this ancient theory, for the fact of reducing the whole plenitude of the real to one or other of its dimensions hardly amounts to an explanation of it. Modern science especially ignores what the ancients denoted by the name of form, precisely because here there is question of a non-quantitative aspect of things, and such ignoring is not unrelated to the fact that this science discerns no criterion in the beauty or ugliness of a phenomenon. The beauty of a thing is the sign of its internal unity, its conformity to an indivisible essence, therefore also to a reality that can neither be counted nor measured. It is necessary to point out here that the notion of form necessarily includes a twofold meaning. On the one hand, it denotes the delineation of a thing, and this is its most usual connotation. In this respect, form is situated on the side of matter, or, more generally, on the side of the plastic substance, which, for its part, limits realities and separates them. On the other hand, form, understood in the sense given it by the Greek philosophers, and after them by the scholastics, is the association of qualities of a being or a thing, and therefore the expression or trace of its immutable essence. The individual world is the formal world because it is the realm of realities constituted by the conjunction of a form with a matter, whether subtle or corporeal. It is only in connection with a matter, or plastic substance, that form plays the part of a principle of individuation. In itself, in its ontological basis, it is not an individual reality, but an archetype, and as such it lies beyond limitations and beyond change. Thus a species is an archetype, 
and if it is only manifested by the individuals belonging to it, it is nonetheless as real and indeed incomparably more real than they are. As for the rationalist criticism that tries to prove the absurdity of the doctrine of archetypes by arguing that a multiplication of mental notions would imply a corresponding multiplication of archetypes leading to the idea of the idea and so forth, it quite misses the point since multiplicity can in no wise be transposed onto the level of archetypal roots. The latter are differentiated in a principal way, with being and in virtue of it, as if being were a single homogeneous crystal potentially containing all possible crystalline forms whatsoever. Multiplicity and quantity therefore exist only at the level of the material reflections of the archetype. From what we have just said, it follows that a species in itself is an immutable form. It could not evolve and become transformed into another species, although it can include variants, all these being diverse projections of a single essential form from which they will never become detached, just as the branches of a tree never become detached from their trunk. It has been justly said that the whole thesis of evolution of species inaugurated by Darwin, rests on a confusion between species and simple variation. It advocates present as the start or bud of a new species, what is really but a variant within the framework of a determinant specific type. This faulty assimilation is, however, insufficient to fill the numberless gaps in the paleontological succession of species, not only are related species separated by profound gaps, but there do not even exist any form such as would indicate a possible thread uniting different orders, like fishes, reptiles, birds, or mammals. One can doubtless find certain fishes using their fins to crawl on the shore, but it is in vain that one would seek among them the least beginning of articulation, which alone would make possible the formation of an arm or a paw. Similarly, if certain resemblances exist between reptiles and birds, their respective skeletons nonetheless exhibit a radically different structure. Thus, for example, the very complex articulation of its jaws in a bird and the connected organization of its hearing apparatus pertains to an entirely different plan from that found in reptiles. It is difficult to conceive how the one might have derived from the other. As for the famous bird fossil Archaeopteryx, it is certainly a bird, despite the claws at the end of its wings, its teeth, and its long tail. In order to account for the absence of intermediate forms, the partitions of transformism sometimes have argued that these forms must have disappeared because of their very imperfection and precariousness. But this argument is plainly in contradiction with the principle of selection that is supposed to be the operative factor in the evolution of species. These sketchy attempts should be incomparably more numerous than the ancestors having already acquired a definitive form. Besides, if the evolution of species represents, as is declared, a gradual and continual process, all the real links in the chain, therefore all those that are destined to be followed, will be at the same time resultants and intermediaries, in which case it is difficult to see why the ones would be much more precarious and more destructible than the others. The more conscientious among modern biologists either reject the transformist theory or else maintain it as a simple working hypothesis. Being unable to conceive any genesis of species that would not be situated in the horizontal line of a purely physical and temporal becoming. For Jean Rostand, the world postulated by transformism is a fairy world, phantasmagoric, surrealistic. The chief point, to which one always returns, is that we have never been present, even in a small way, at one authentic phenomenon of evolution. We keep the impression that nature today has nothing to offer that might be capable of reducing our embarrassment before the genuinely organic metamorphosis implied in the transformist thesis. We keep the impression that, in the matter of the genesis of species as in that of the genesis of life, the forces that constructed nature are now absent from nature. 
Even so, this biologist sticks to the transformist theory. I firmly believe, because I see no means of doing otherwise, that mammals have come from lizards and lizards from fish. But when I declare, and when I think such a thing, I try not to avoid seeing its indigestible enormity, and I prefer to leave vague the origin of these scandalous metamorphoses, rather than add to their improbability that of a ludicrous interpretation. All that paleontology proves to us is that the various animal forms such as are shown by fossils preserved in successive layers of the earth made their appearance in a vaguely ascending order, going from relatively undifferentiated organisms, but not simple ones, to ever more complex forms, without this ascension representing, however, a univocal and continuous line. It seems to move in jumps, that is to say, whole categories of animals appear at once, without real predecessors. What means this order then? Simply that on the material plane, the simple or relatively undifferentiated always precedes the complex and differentiated. All matter is like a mirror that reflects the activity of the essences by inverting it. That is why the seed comes before the tree and the leaf bud before the flower, whereas in the principal order, perfect forms pre-exist. The successive appearance of animal forms according to an ascending hierarchy therefore in no wise proves their continual and cumulative genesis. On the contrary, on the contrary, that which binds the diverse animal forms to one another is something like a common model, which reveals itself more or less through their structures, and which is more apparent in the case of animals endowed with superior consciousness, such as birds and mammals. This model is expressed, for instance, in the symmetrical disposition of the body, in the number of extremities and sensory organs, as also in the general form of the chief internal organs. It might be suggested that the design and number of certain organs, and especially those of sensation, simply correspond to the terrestrial surroundings, but this argument is reversible, since those surroundings are precisely what the sensory organs grasp and delimit. In fact, the model underlying all animal forms establishes the analogy between the microcosm and the macrocosm. Against the background of this common cosmic pattern, the differences between species and the gaps separating the ones from the others are all the more marked. Instead of missing links, which the partisans of transformism vainly seek, nature offers us, as if in irony, a large variety of animal forms which, without coming out of the pre-established framework of a species, imitate the appearance and customs of a species or order foreign to them. Thus, for example, whales are mammals but borrow the aspect and behavior of fishes, hummingbirds have the appearance or iridescent coloring, the flight and the mode of feeding associated with butterflies, the armadillo is covered with scales like a reptile while being a mammal, and so on. Most of these animals of imitative form represent superior species that take on the aspect of relatively inferior ones, a fact that excludes a priori are interpreting them as intermediary links of an evolution. As for their interpretation as forms of adaptation to determined surroundings, this seems more than dubious. For what could be, for instance, the intermediate forms between some land mammal or other and the dolphin? Among these imitative forms, representing as many extreme cases, we must also include the fossil bird, Archaeopteryx, mentioned above. Since each animal order represents an archetype that includes the archetypes of its corresponding species, one might well ask oneself whether the existence of imitative animal forms does not contradict the immutability of the essential forms. But this is not the case, for the existence of such mimics, on the contrary, demonstrates that immutability by a logical exhausting of all the possibilities inherent in a given type or given essential form. It is as if nature, after bringing forth fishes, reptiles, birds, and mammals with their distinctive characters, wished besides to show that she was able to produce an animal like the dolphin, which while remaining a true mammal, 
possesses at the same time almost all the faculties of a fish, or a creature like the tortoise, which possesses a skeleton covered in flesh, yet at the same time is enclosed in an external carapace after the fashion of certain mollusks. Thus does nature manifest her protein power, her inexhaustible capacity for generation, even while remaining faithful to the essential forms which are in fact never blurred. Each essential form, or each archetype, includes after its own fashion all the others, but without confusion. It is like a mirror reflecting other mirrors, which in turn also reflect it. By its deepest significance, the mutual reflection of types is an expression of the metaphysical continuity of existence or of the unity of being. Some biologists, in regard to the discontinuity of the paleontological succession of species, postulate an evolution by leaps, and in order to render this theory plausible, refer to the sudden mutations observed among certain living species. But these mutations never exceed the limits of an anomaly, or a decadence, as for example the sudden appearance of albinos, or of dwarves, or giants. Even when these characteristics incidentally became hereditary, they remain as anomalies and never constitute new specific forms. For this to happen, it would be necessary for the vital substance of an extant species to serve as the plastic material for a newly manifested specific form. Practically, this means that one or more females of the species qua substance would suddenly bear the fruit of a new species. Now, as was written by the Hermetist Richard the Englishman, nothing can be produced from a thing that is not contained in it. By this fact, every species, every genus, or every natural order develops within the limits proper to it and bears fruits according to its own kind and not according to an essentially different order. All that receives a seed must be of the same seed. Basically, the evolutionist thesis is an attempt to replace not the miracle of creation, but the cosmogonic process, largely supersensual, of which the biblical narrative is a scriptural symbol. Evolutionism, by abusively making the greater derive from the less, is the reverse of that process or that emanation, which, moreover, has nothing in common with the emanationist heresy, since the transcendence and immutability of the ontological principle are here in no wise called in question. In a word, evolutionism results from an incapacity, peculiar to modern science, to conceive dimensions of reality other than those of purely physical sequences. To understand the vertical genesis of species, it is worth recalling what Ganon said about the progressive solidification of the corporeal state through the various terrestrial eras. This solidification must obviously not be taken to imply that the stones of the earliest ages were soft, for this would be tantamount to saying that certain physical qualities, and in particular hardness and density, were then wanting. What has hardened and become fixed with time is the corporeal state viewed as a whole, with the result that it no longer receives directly the imprint of subtle forms. Assuredly, it cannot become detached from this subtle state, which is its ontological root and by which it is entirely dominated, but the relationship between the two states of existence no longer has the creative character that it possessed at the origin. It is as when a fruit having reached maturity becomes surrounded by an even harder husk and ceases to absorb the sap of the tree. In a cyclic phase where bodily existence had not yet reached this degree of solidification, a new specific form could manifest itself directly starting from its first condensation in the subtle or anemic state. That is to say, the different types of animals pre-existed at the level immediately above the corporeal world as non-spatial forms but clothed with a certain matter, that of the subtle world. Thence these forms descended into the corporeal state, wherever the latter was ready to receive them, and this descent had the nature of a sudden coagulation, and hence also the nature of a limitation or fragmentation of the original anemic form. A Neo-Tibetan cosmology describes this descent, which is also a fall, in the case of a human being under the form of the mythological combat of the Divas and Asuras. 
that Davis, having created man with a body that was fluid, protean, and diaphanous, that is to say, in a subtle form, the Asuras try to destroy it by a progressive petrification. This body becomes opaque, it gets fixed, and its skeleton, overcome by the petrifying process, is immobilized. Then the devas, turning evil into good, create joints after having fractured the bones, and they likewise open the ways of the senses by piercing the skull, which threatens to imprison the seed of the mind. Thus the solidifying process stops before reaching its extreme limit, and certain organs in man, such as the eye, still keep something of the nature of the non-corporeal states. In this story, the pictorial description of the subtle world must not be misunderstood. Howbeit, it is certain that the process of materialization, going from suprasensory to sensory, had to be reflected within the material or corporeal state itself, so that one is on safe ground in saying that the first generations of a new species did not leave a mark in the great book of earthly layering. It is therefore useless to want to seek in sensible matter the ancestors of a species and especially those of man. The transformist theory not being founded on any real proof, its corollary and final outcome, namely the thesis of the infrahuman origin of man, remains suspended in the void. The facts put forward in favor of this thesis reduce themselves to a few groups of skeletons of disparate dating. It happens that skeletal types deemed more evolved, such as the man of Steinheim, precede others of a seemingly more primitive character, such as the Neanderthal man, even though this latter example was doubtless not so ape-like as tendentious reconstructionists would have us believe. If, instead of always putting the question where humankind begins and what is the degree of evolution of such and such a type counted among prehumans, we were to ask ourselves, how far does the monkey go? Things might well appear in a very different light. For a fragment from a skeleton, even if it be related to that of man, is hardly enough to establish the presence of that which makes man, namely reason. Whereas it is possible to conceive of a great variety of anthropoid apes whose anatomies are more or less close to that of man. However paradoxical this may seem, the anatomical resemblance between man and the anthropoid apes is precisely explainable by the difference, not gradual but essential, separating man from all other animals. Since the anthropoid form is able to exist without that central element that characterizes man, and that moreover is manifested anatomically by his vertical position among other things, that form must exist. In other words, there cannot be but found, at the purely animal level, a form that realizes its own way, that is to say, according to the laws of its own level, the very plan of the human anatomy. It is in this sense that the monkey is a prefiguration of man, not as an evolutionary phase, but in virtue of that law that decrees that at every level of existence, analogous possibilities will be found. One more question arises in the face of the fossils ascribed to primitive men. Did certain of these skeletons belong to men we can look upon as being ancestors of men presently alive, or do they bear witness to the existence of a few groups that survived the cataclysm at the end of a terrestrial epoch in order to disappear in their turn before the arising of our present humanity? Instead of primitive men, it might well be a case of degenerate men, whether these did or did not exist side by side with our real ancestors. We know that the folklore of most peoples speak of giants or dwarves who lived long ago in remote countries. Now, among the skeletons in question, several cases of gigantism are to be found. Lastly, let it once more be recalled that the bodies of the most ancient men have not necessarily left solid traces, either because their bodies were not yet materialized or solidified to that point, or else because the spiritual state of those men, conjointly with the cosmic conditions of their time, rendered possible a resorption of the physical body into the subtle body at the moment of death. 
we must now say a few words about a thesis today much in vogue, which claims to be something like a spiritual integration of paleontology, but which in reality is nothing but a purely mental sublimation of the crudest materialism, with all the prejudices this includes, from the belief in an indefinite progress of humanity to a leveling and totalitarian collectivism, without forgetting the cult of the machine that is at the center of all this. It will be apparent that this is about the Teilhardian evolutionism that we intend to speak here. According to Teilhard de Chardin, who hardly worries over the gaps inherent in the evolutionist system and largely banks on the climate created by the premature popularization of the transformist thesis, according to him, man himself would only represent an intermediate stage of an evolution, starting with unicellular organisms and ending up in a sort of global cosmic entity in union with God. The craze for trying to bring everything back to a single, univocal, and uninterrupted genetic line here exceeds the material plane and launches out wildly into an irresponsible and avid mentalization characterized by an abstraction clothed in artificial images which their author ends up by taking literally, as if it were a case of concrete realities. We have already mentioned the imaginary genealogical tree of species, of which the supposed unity is but a snare, being made up by the hypothetical conjunction of many disjointed elements. Teilhard amplifies this notion to his heart's content in a manner that is purely graphic by completing its branches, or scales as he prefers to call them, and by constructing its pinnacle in the direction of which humankind would supposedly be situated. By a similar sliding of thought from abstract to concrete, from figuration to what is deemed real, he agglutinates, in one and the same pseudo-scientific sprouting, the most diverse realities such as mechanical laws, vital forces, psychic elements, and spiritual entities. Let us quote a characteristic passage. That which explains the biological revolution caused by the apparition of man is an explosion of consciousness, and that which, in its turn, explains this explosion of consciousness is simply the passage of a privileged radius of corpuscularization, that is to say, of a zoological phylum across the surface, hitherto impermeable, separating the zone of direct psychism from that of reflected psychism. Having reached, following this particular ray, a critical point of arrangement, or, as we say here of enrollment, life became hyper-centered on itself, to the point of being capable of foresight and invention. Thus, corpuscularization, which is a physical process, would have as its effect that a zoological phylum, which is only a figure, passed across the surface, purely hypothetical, separating two psychic zones. But one must not be surprised at this absence of distinguo in Teilhard's thinking, since according to his own theory, the spirit is but a metamorphosis of matter. Without stopping to discuss the strange theology of this author, for whom God himself evolves with matter, and without daring to define what he thinks of the prophets and sages of antiquity and other underdeveloped beings of this kind, we will say the following. If man, under the double relationship of his physical nature and his spiritual nature, were really nothing but a phase of an evolution going from the amoeba to the superman, how could he know objectively where he stands in all this? Let us suppose that this alleged evolution forms a curve, say a spiral. The man who is but a fragment thereof, and let it not be forgotten that a fragment of a movement is but a phase of that movement, can that man step out of it and say to himself, I am the fragment of a spiral developing in such and such a way. Now, it is certain, and Teilhard de Chardin recognizes this moreover, that man is able to judge of his own state. In effect, he knows his own rank amid other terrestrial beings. He is even alone in knowing objectively both himself and the world. 
Far from being a simple phase in an indefinite evolution, man represents essentially a central possibility, unique therefore, irreplaceable, and definitive. If the human species had to evolve toward another more perfect and more spiritual form, man would not already now be the point of intersection of the divine spirit with the terrestrial plane. He would neither be capable of salvation nor intellectually able to surmount the flux of becoming. To express these thoughts according to the gospel perspective, would God have become man if the form of the latter were not virtually God on earth, that is to say, qualitatively central as well as definitive in relation to his own cosmic level? As a symptom of our time, tailhardism is comparable to one of those cracks that are due to the very solidification of the mental carapace, and that do not open upward toward the heaven of true and transcendent unity, but downward toward the realm of the inferior psychism. Wary of its own discontinuous vision of the world, the materialist mind lets itself slide toward a false continuity or unity, toward a pseudo-spiritual intoxication of which this falsified and materialized faith, or this sublimated materialism that we have just described, marks a phase of particular significance.